And when speaking about the translation, um, we need to remember that, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, according to um, Jakobson in his uh, On Linguistic Aspects of Translation, we can speak about a translation in three different senses. As intralingual translation, this happens when we somehow reformulate, reword uh, a text. Um, paraphrase is what we usually... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Paraphrase is what we usually mean by that kind of re rewarding. And uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the first, the first sense in which we can speak about translation, according to Jacobson, is the intralingual translation. Uh, in that case, what happens is that uh, we use um, a different way um for expressing this very same text this is what we usually mean by rewarding or by paraphrase and uh, of course there is a, a very interesting debate concerning the relationship between uh, uh, paraphrase and literature or um, the relationship between the identity of the literary work and the paraphrases then there is the interlingual translation uh, which is translation in proper sense it is when we um, uh, transport um, a text uh, in a different language from the original one. Think about the beginning of uh, Flaubert's masterpiece. Uh, Nous étions à l'étude quand le proviseur entra suivi d'un nouveau habillé en bourgeois. In the Penguin edition, translated by Geoffrey Wall, we, have, we, are, we were at prep when the head came in, followed by a new boy not in uniform. In that case, the original French has been uh, transformed in English. Then the third sense of translation, the intersemiotic translation, uh, takes place uh, when we um, transport uh, the text um, in a different uh, medium. Uh, always referring to Madame Bovary, remember the movie by Chapol. We have the literary work, and then we have a move. Okay, uh, I will try to make some points on translation by working on the second point, that is uh, translation in proper sense. Uh, what does it mean to translate uh, a literary work? In Ubersin Bedeutung, uh, Frege explains um, how the difference between the original text and its translation should uh, not involve sense um, uh, or, re or reference, that is, Zinum Bedeutung uh, should uh, be preserved. Um, and if so, then the translation is said to be correct. But in order to be also good, and this is what we normally uh, want when reading a literary translation, to be also good, the translation uh, should also manage to preserve those aspects that Frege presents as the coloring and shading which poetic eloquence seeks to give to the sense. Such coloring and shading are not objective and must be evoked by each reader or reader according to the hints of the poet or the speaker. Without some affinity in human ideas, art would certainly be impossible but it can never be exactly determined how far the intentions of the poet are realized. So this is what a good translator uh, should be uh, able to do. And the, the, the point um, having to do with uh, colors and um, um, uh, shades are absolutely important and difficult to be uh, considered. Why? Because they are what we usually um, have in mind when we speak about the style, about the hand of the writer. That's why, according to many, uh, translations are somehow impossible. Okay? Uh, according to Joachim du Bellet, one should better uh, speak about the traitors than about uh, translators. Um, 
because what uh, uh, happens when we have to do with literary translator translations is that we have a text saying almost the same thing by using the title of an essay written by Umberto Eco. But in literature, saying almost the same thing does not seem to be enough. Um, a good way could be that of considering translations as a sort of negotiation, okay? Then a process where in order to obtain something, something else has to be given up. We need to renounce to something in order to have something back. What is that we want back? Is a sort of the possibility to have an access to the literary work. Of course, exceptions are uh, always possible, um, even uh, on the level of meaning and on the level of style as well. Uh, a very famous example is the one uh, by uh, Goethe's Faust that uh, was translated in French by Gerard de Nerval. And uh, the comment of Goethe on this translation was, uh, je ne me suis jamais compris si bien qu'en vous lisant. Uh, I, I've, uh, I never understood myself so well than uh, reading your translation. But I mean, these are exceptions, okay? Uh, uh, usually we, we lose something very important when we have to do with the translation. But, but um, um, we are uh, somehow uh, happy because we uh, have the impression that the accessibility of the meaning has been preserved. There are also uh, interesting cases concerning those texts that do not have a meaning or that do not seem to uh, have any meaning as the Jabberwock or Jabberwock by Lewis Carroll. In those cases, of course, to translate that text cannot uh, mean to preserve the, the uh, sense and the reference of the text because there are no sense and no reference. Uh, in that case, the, trans the translator is supposed to uh, play a sort of Carroll-like game by proposing in the translation those linguistic acrobatics and inventions that uh, Carroll uh, proposed in the original version. Um, what is important uh, in, in, the, in, in that example, for instance, is also that the translation tries to preserve those sort of um, activations that uh, the original text um, does uh, in the native speaker. Think about uh, these uh, slitty toves, okay? Um, maybe in English speaker people, these uh, activate uh, a sort of uh, a connection with the slimy, slighter, slippery. And uh, uh, what we should uh, see when uh, evaluating uh, such a translation is, for instance, if Blique, uh, that uh, we find in the French translation that uh, Antonin Artaud did uh, directly from the asylum. And this is an interesting point when uh, dealing with such examples. Um, if uh, Blique uh, is able to activate something of the same sort for uh, French people. Um, so this is for what concerns text having no meaning uh, or no um, um, traditional meaning. We also have text having too many meanings. Uh, this uh, is an example by Joyce, which is polysimus, or which is multilingual. And the example um, um, of that uh, translation is interesting because it shows uh, how many different levels of access should be preserved in order to have a translation that can be considered as good. Uh, here, what is interesting is also for what concerns the Italian translation, for instance, that you find uh, James Joyce working together with the Italian translator Nino Frank. So in that case, maybe we have more chances to preserve the style because the author is still present in the translation, okay? Um, uh, and this is not what happens for the French translation that was realized by Beckett and the sort of pool of international uh, translators uh, in order not really to translate in the sense of respecting the original text, but in the sense of understanding, which was the mechanism uh, making this language be so productive.
Um, okay, for what concerns text translated by uh, th th their authors, um, another interesting example is the Mercier Canier that was originally written by Sam Beckett in French. Uh, as you surely know, uh, Beckett uh, loved the writing in French because according to him, it was the, the best way to write without any style, that is without any colors, without any shades. Um, in fact, when, when uh, uh, asked why he decided to write in French, his answer was because um, um, I, I have no style in French, okay? And his French was very elementary. Uh, then uh, four years uh, later, uh, Beckett himself realized the, the translation of his Mercier Camier, and you, you have uh, um, an immediate uh, um, impression about which was the language that he could manage better, okay? Uh, think about the difference between uh, raisonnement de clerc, dit Monsieur Conner, and sophistry, said Mr. Conner. Okay, even the texture of the language is um, different. Okay, so um, how, uh, how to deal with the style together with meaning? Let's uh, focus on easier examples than these ones, because uh, Jabberwock, um, Finnegan's Wake, uh, uh, and maybe uh, Beckett himself uh, are quite difficult examples to try to, to, to focus on. But think about easier examples, okay? We all, I mean, I have surely uh, read, for instance, the Russian in, uh, in uh, translation, um, Ibsen in translation, Jensen, Murakami, Mayerova, and so on. So, I mean, even if uh, we have so many doubts about translations, this is what we, we mostly read when we read such authors. Um, so we have the access to the meaning, but we have maybe problems uh, with the, the, the style uh, of the authors. The example of Costanz Garnet is interesting because remember that Josef Brodsky um, underlined the fact that if uh, the Anglo-Saxon speakers uh, thought that Tolstoy and Dostoevsky were so similar, it was because uh, the um, um, translator of both, Constance Garnett, translated both um, by giving them just one style, her own. That's why they seem so similar, even if for um, a, a literary critique as Vladimir Nabokov, they are totally, totally different. Okay, so um, a suggestion that has been given is that maybe this has to do with our being human beings when we translate. So maybe non-human uh, translators would make a better job. Uh, this is not what happens, as for instance, um, experimental studies uh, given by Toral and Wei have demonstrated what we can have, uh, even thanks to this modern uh, uh, automatic translators. That is not those rule based, but the ones we have today that are based on neural systems. What these uh, translators give is a sort of good basis for working for translators as well, but nothing more. Um, Cicero uh, gives us uh, um, uh, two directions in order to translate. Uh, um, in a good way. According to him, we can translate either um, ad literam, that is a literal translation, or ad sensu, which is the translation that is um, an interpretation. Um, notoriously, the most criticized book by Nabokov um, before Lolita was uh, his translation of um, the Onegin by Pushkin, which was an absolutely literal translation, but it was so literal that it somehow vehiculated the idea that translations were impossible because you could see the Russian behind it. There's a reason for this, of course, because he, he, um, he first decided to do the translation in order to uh, make his students have an access to the original version. So it was a sort of bridge to, to access to uh, Pushkin's uh, uh, masterpiece. Um, uh, but uh, what you have is just a, a sort of uh, um, um, English bridge to the uh, Russian translation. Therefore, it is not a good translation in the sense of trying, even trying to preserve colors and shades. 
Svetlana Geyer, which is the Ukrainian um, translator of uh, the Fünf Elefanten, the, 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 the five big works of Dostoevsky in German, um, defended uh, the idea that a good translation should uh, always interpret. That is, you read and then you somehow repropose um, um, the text you have read. Um, But I mean, the, the idea that we have uh, naively is that the translation should be absolutely respectful of the original. Uh, that's why, according to some, for instance, Walter Benjamin, the translation has to be transparent. It, 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 it need not to cover uh, the original. And Shapiro um, uh, emphasizes the fact that when a translation uh, is not transparent, um, what happens is that we notice those imperfections resulting from the, the not exact match, matching from the original to the uh, final text. Um, this is the point I would like to make and that maybe we can discuss together um, uh, after um, the talk. Uh, but uh, if the translation uh, has somehow to be transparent in this sense, then how could it be such um, if language, as we have seen from the beginning, is intrinsically opaque by using um, um, a label um, um, used by Peter Lamarck and by the formalists before him? Uh, that is, if um, opacity has to be seen as a special characteristic of uh, literary language, then um, how to defend such an idea concerning translation? That is, that a translation should somehow uh, try to produce a text so transparent that it does not seem translated. Um, in order to explain what he has in mind when speaking about opacity, uh, Peter Lamarck compares uh, or remembers to the reader two different kinds of uh, uh, opacity that have been longly debated in philosophy. These are referential and representational opacity. Um, referential opacity has to do with um, propositional attitudes, that is, those cases where uh, substitution uh, is not admitted. Uh, why? Because take uh, the famous case of uh, Cicero denounced uh, Catilin, whereas in this case we can uh, substitute Cicero with Tully uh, without disturbing the truth value of um, the assertion. This not, does not happen in the case of uh, Ellis' beliefs that Cicero denounced uh, um, Catilin. Uh, and that, therefore we say that the context is opaque. Um, another example uh, Lamarck remembers is the one um, that takes place in the comparison between uh, paintings and photographs. Okay, uh, these are good examples according to him uh, in order to explain the difference between transparent language and opaque language. Whereas transparent language aims at communicating something, a content. In opaque language, what is fundamental is not this very content, but the way that content is presented. Therefore, substitution is not admissible. Um, uh, therefore, what we should um, focus on is that particular composition of words. Um, Take the beginning of a very famous book um, and take the way uh, that very content is vehiculated in that specific form, okay? Um, uh, look at the texture, the rhythm, the alliteration, the vocabulary, the matter, Lolita, light of my life, a fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita, the tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palais to tap, a tree on the teeth. Okay, 
uh, this uh, um, shows how this um, um, opacity um, sounds for the reader. We could, of course, and this is an option that uh, um, um, Lamarck uh, considers, we could, of course, being, uh, be interested in Lolita just for its content. Okay, we could say, uh, we could be interested in reading about this story, the story uh, about an incest, about this um, sexual meetings between Humbert Humbert and Lolita. This would be a way of reading Lolita, but this wouldn't be an opaque way of reading Lolita. Uh, this would be a transparent way of being Lorita. This happens when we are interested in, in its content, in its plot, but not in the use, in the specific use of language Lolita consists in. Uh, that's why, according to Peter Lamarck, um, uh, when dealing with translations, uh, what and when being interested in the opacity of language. Uh, we should um, make a comparison between translations and paraphrase because translations would be a, a sort of paraphrase. This is a quote by Lamarck. Translation is a special case of paraphrasability. The ambivalent attitude that readers have towards translations of literary fictional narratives reflects the view we have taken about the interest relativity of narrative content. For some, a good translation is indeed substitutable for the original, such that to have read the translation counts as having read the work itself. For others, however uh, good a translation, it is never substitutable without loss. Those in the former camp are satisfied that a fairly stringent criterion of sameness of meaning will preserve the content that needs to be preserved. Their interest in the narrative as, in effect, propositional content will be served if propositional meaning is retained. Those in the latter camp may even stricter demands of narrative content. Propositional meaning matters, as do far more fine-grained aspects underlying the precise way that meaning is conveyed, including nuance, connotation, tone, character, and so on. Their reading maximizes opacity. Um, th this is an important point also if we consider uh, those cases um, where, for instance, um, uh, substitutions of uh, offensive terms have been suggested. Okay, you, you surely remember this debate um, um, concerning those efforts of removing potentially offensive language from the classics. Okay, think about Roald Dahl, think about uh, Agatha Christie. And for instance, what is interesting is James Pritchard which is the grandson, the great grandson of Agatha Christie, uh, when authorizing for such a remove of these uh, offensive terms, uh, motivated uh, his uh, authorization by saying that, um, according to him, um, it was important to um, take away these offensive terms because all he, he cared about was that people could go on uh, enjoying Agatha Christie's stories forever. Okay, so her stories, the content of her novels, not the novels themselves. Of course, admittingly that we want to recognize um, a literary language in um, uh, Agatha Christie's uh, works. Um, uh, then it seems that um, readers uh, interested in plots, will be satisfied with translations, whereas readers interested in linguistic intricacies will refuse any translation. Of course, literary works are not all the same. Uh, we have different literary genres. There are some literary genres where it seems that the plot is more important. Think about crimes. Uh, there are other literary works where um, uh, the texture of the language is absolutely fundamental. This happens notoriously in poetry. Um, the very last point I would like to share with you, which is an enormous point, but which is fundamental when dealing about translation, has to do with um, when speaking about translation, we need to go back to literary works uh, and their definitions. So how, how uh, to consider the identity of literary works 
uh, when um, uh, trying to uh, make some points on uh, translation. Um, these are the main positions, notoriously defended um, in, in order to explain um, what are uh, literary works and uh, which are the identity conditions. The more rigid one is the textualist position defended by Goodman and Goodman and Delgin. According to them, what happens is that uh, literary works have to be identified with text. Then the linguistic structure consisting of the configuration of spaces, punctuation marks, letters in a specific language and in a specific order. This position has been um, strongly criticized because it is too rigid. According to Greg Curry, for instance, it is um, um, persuasive just in order to defend uh, the distinction between allographic and autographic works uh, in Nelson Goodman. Um, I, I do believe that in order to um, um, defend uh, opacity and uh, is impossibility to allow for substitution, textualism is an interesting position. I will explain you why just in my closing remarks. Um, another position quite uh, important against textualism has been um, defended by Wilsmore. It brings the example of Virginia Woolf's uh, To the Lighthouse that uh, in the American and uh, in the British edition uh, does present, uh, um, to, uh, presents two different texts. Um, and then uh, if uh, um, textualism were right, then we would have a problem. That's why according to Wilsmore, this is not a good position. Then a more uh, complex, uh, but maybe um, a position that tries to uh, explain different levels of literary works is the one defended by Amy Thomason by following uh, the position originally defended by Homan in Garden. It is the position distinguishing bet uh, between text compositions and literary works. Whereas texts are sequences of symbols in a language, Compositions are those texts as created by a certain author in a specific um, moment. And then literary works are all these together. That is the text, uh, the author, but also the literary community accepting, evaluating, interpreting this very same text. That's why um, um, Thomason's uh, position concerning literary works uh, considered um, as holes can be uh, seen as uh, a form of interpretationism. And constructionism by uh, Silensborg defends the idea that uh, the text is nothing per se because the text needs to be uh, somehow uh, constructed by readers. Then the work is a sort of mental construct as it has been underlined, uh, for instance, by Davis, by Carroll. What is important here is, uh, again, to clarify what interpretations are and whether different agents can share the same interpretation or not. Um, uh, my final remarks um, are the following. OK, it seems to me that if interested in opacity, as we should be when dealing with uh, literature and um, uh, their translation, um, we need to um, uh, pay attention to literary language, to respect the literary language in its specificity, um, and therefore to the very naive uh, question, uh, would you consider the translation as different from the original wor uh, work? Everybody would answer, yes, of course, the translation is different from the original work. Therefore, I see the plausibility of textualism that uh, even if uh, rigid um, guarantees us to, to, I mean, to, to leave untouched the original text. In order to answer objections as the ones raised by Wilsmore, for instance, against textualism, the one having to do with Virginia Woolf's uh, um, two editions of To the Lighthouse. Okay. Uh, that case is a sort of, um, um, it had to do with the publication of uh, the, the book uh, written by Virginia Woolf. And the difference is 
from the American uh, um, and the British translations had to do with the way Virginia Woolf corrected the proofs, okay? In the one uh, case, uh, these proofs were corrected a lot, and in the and uh, um, in, in the other uh, case, less. Uh, but we would consider both as the very same literary work, even following textualism. Why? Because I mean, if we think about uh, Walter Stoff's position and uh, his way of uh, um, somehow correcting um, textualism itself we can uh, admit uh, small changes or um, ameliorations or uh, uh, the possibility to um, eliminate uh, mistakes. This is what happens even not, not only on, on, on the language, not only on typos, but on content as well for the second edition of The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco where he wanted, for instance, to, to take away the, the pepper sauce because uh, during the Middle Ages, when the novel um, takes place, there were no peppers in Europe. So, of course, this was a problem, okay? But this was, I mean, just it came out that the, the sauce was not of uh, pepper, but of something else. So I think that we can, we can accept even those small changes by adopting a textualist position, which is uh, absolutely interesting in order to defend uh, opacity, which is what uh, I, I think is really um, at stake when dealing with literature and with translation. Okay, thank you. <laughs>